that they would take turns in sitting in the gathering of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one day Sayyidina Umar would sit all day long and hear what he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was teaching. And the next day his friend would sit all day long and hear what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was teaching. And each of them, uh, the, the day that they would be studying from the Prophet Sallallahu each of them in the evening would meet the other and revise and teach the other everything that they had learned from the Prophet Sallallahu So this is how eager they were that they would go out for their worldly affairs also but they would leave behind representatives they would leave behind those who would memorize and study and learn for them and deliver that to them also so that they didn't miss out on any of the jewels that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, would uh, say uh, Shaykh Maryam she said that when she was in Damascus uh, and she would go for her lessons she said there were times when the bus would come late there were times when the buses would come late and she would be very anxious in reaching her lesson on time so that she doesn't miss any of the jewels that are to be delivered she said uh, I would run in the streets of Damascus to reach my lesson, not caring about what people would say, this woman is running. This woman is running. She said, I would run in the streets of Damascus, and people would say, why is she running? And I'd say, I don't want to miss a jewel, and if I missed one jewel, I don't want to miss the next jewel. And I would be eager to be present to the lessons of uh, the great Allama, the Fatih of the world, Shaykh Adib al kallas radiallahu uh, I would try, I would be eager to be present in the lesson she said before the Shaykh attended. Before the Shaykh attended. So that I didn't miss out on anything that the Shaykh was delivering, any of the states upon which the Shaykh was delivering radiallahu an. And this was the state of the Sahaba, radiallahu alayhim, that they would go to far extents to travel just to hear a single hadith of the Prophet The Sahaba would travel from Medina to Munawwara all the way to the lands of Sham just to hear one hadith. The Sahaba would travel from Medina to Munawwara all the way to Egypt, North Africa, just to hear one hadith. Just to hear one hadith. And they would arrive, hear the hadith, and immediately return. Why would they immediately return? So that their intentions are not mixed with the affairs of the world and their intent is absolutely pure for the sake of hearing the words of the Prophet Imam Muslim, one of his teachers, Imam Sibzi he would take his young son to the classes of Hadith and this was a tradition of the scholars that they would take their young children with them to the lessons of Hadith why? so that their children get to see uh, scholars who are uh, uh, get to see scholars who are much older than them in age and have very high chains of narration. So what the scholars would do, they would take their young children to their teachers, to the teachers of their parents, and oftentimes what would happen, oftentimes what would happen is that child who would attend with his father, with his mother in the lessons of hadith. And that child, when the child would grow up, that child would have the highest and the strongest means of narration of hadith. Why? Because his father took him to the lessons of hadith with his teachers, i.e. He, he, he was connected, this child was connected to the teachers of his father. So he skipped a generation and went above. He skipped a generation and went about. And there is a Sheikh in Morocco now, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Kittani, who his father would take him uh, to the circles of Hadith when he was a very young child, when he was a very young boy, and he would ask his teachers, i.e., his father would ask his teachers when they would grant him ijazat, permission in narrating Hadith, that they would also grant his child permission in narrating hadith so that when he is able and when he is qualified enough to narrate then he will be narrating from the generation of teachers who are the teachers of his father so he skips an entire generation and is attached and these types of scholars 
the scholars say, من ألحق الصغار بالكبار Those who connected the young with the elderly. Those who connected the young with the elderly. Is that clear? This is why one of our teachers, Sheikh Bakri Al-Tarabishi, he had the highest ijazah in narrating the Quran al karim upon planet Earth. Upon planet Earth. And when people would ask him about this, he would say, it's not a miracle of mine. He would say, it's not a miracle of mine. But rather, when I went from Syria to Egypt to study, the shaykh that I studied Quran with was a very old, was very old in age, was very, was very elderly, and I was very young. I was very young, and my teacher was very elderly. So I studied with him, and I, uh, I was granted ijazah. And then after, all of the other students, all of my other colleagues from that teacher were much, much older than me, because the teacher was so old. So obviously, his students were much, much older than me. All of them have died, and I am the only one surviving upon planet Earth. This is why his ijazah, his chain of transmission of narrating the Quran al karim upon planet Earth was the strongest and the highest summit ever. Why? Because his father sent him out to study whilst he was young. And when he was young, he got to meet those who were much, much older. Much, much older than him. Is that correct? So, and in Damascus, there were still students of Shaykh Badruddin al Hassan al Allah still alive. Still alive. So, those who got to meet them, then between them and Imam Badruddin al Hassan, there was only one person. So, the likes of uh, Shaykh Salim al Hamami, the likes of Shaykh Ahmad Nasib al Mahami, Shaykh Yusuf al Akbar, uh, Shaykh Usman al Miqdad. These were people who studied with Sheikh Badruddin al Hassan. These were people who studied with him directly and they were still alive in Damascus. Then there were those who didn't actually study with him. So, uh, and they sat in his open gatherings like uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Shahuri and Sheikh Mustafa al Kumani and others. Sheikh Kareem Rajah, he said, everything of goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever gave me in my life was because I saw Imam Badruddin al-Hassani walk down the street one day when I was a young boy. When I was a young boy, I just saw this Imam once and I attribute every goodness that Allah ever gave me to that one look. Sheikh Mustafa al-Turkmani, they say he was playing in the streets of Damascus and Imam Badruddin al-Hassan came up to him, came up to him in particular from amongst the other children and said to him, Mali hadha khulqat, you were created for this. The famous statement, this is a very famous statement of the earliest scholars, right? Mali hadha khulqat, you were created for this. He said to, the, uh, he said to Sheikh Mustafa when he was a young child and he envisaged in him in the future that day he will have a great future ahead of him great future ahead of him. So it's very important that uh, people seek out uh, those who are elderly from amongst the scholars of Islam so that we are connected by means of them to those who they saw. So for example, when we visited Shaykh Salim al-Hammami rahmatullahi alayhi and we asked him to speak about Shaykh Badruddin al-Hassan radiallahu anhu and he spoke and one of the most beautiful things that he said he said, our Shaykh, the great Imam, the Muhaddis al-Akbar, the highest scholar of Hadith uh, in the lands of Sham, he used to make a dua, which was, Allahumma ghfir li, wa ghfir li man ra'ani, wa ghfir li man ra'a man ra'ani. Oh Allah, forgive me, and forgive those who see me, and forgive those who see those who saw me. So we said, to Shaykh Salim, Alhamdulillah, Annana Ra'inakum. Praise be to Allah that we saw you, and hence we have taken from the dua of Shaykh Badruddin. Hence we have taken from the dua of Shaykh Badruddin. So, meeting with these people, coming in to contact with these people, connects us to the high lofty people that they met. Huh? That they met. So, for example, uh, Shaykh Sabir, who is coming, he's he, he studied with uh, teachers, 
he studied with teachers of his parents' generation. He studied with teachers of his father's generation. So he skipped a whole generation. Right? So who did he study film with? He studied with Sheikh Abu Yusuf. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abu Yusuf Abideen, who was one of the great grand nephews of the great Imam of the Hanafi school, Imam Muhammad Amin ibn Umar ibn Abideen. And when Shaykh Sahar studied with him, he was a young boy, he was a young lad, maybe 14 or 15. At the same time, at the same time, the great Imam of the Hanafi school, the Andama of his time, Shaykh Abib al-Kandas Ahmadullahi, was also studying with Shaykh Abu Yusuf Abidi. So, Shaykh Sahar, he studied with the teachers of his teachers. He studied with the teachers of his teachers. And likewise, Sheikh Kareem Rajah, who was the Sheikh of Quran of Damascus, uh, he memorized the Quran and he was granted ijazah. Then his own teacher, Sheikh Hussein al Khattab, took him to his teachers, and both student and teacher studied with the teachers. So Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Kareem Rajah studied with his teacher, Shaykh Hussain Khattab, but he also studied with the teachers of his teacher, uh, the Alwani, uh, sorry, the Alwani family uh, in Arabi, who were the great scholars and masters of the Quran and Kareem in their times. Is that clear? So, uh, from the benefits of seeking out the elder scholars uh, and be, uh, sitting in their gatherings is that we will pick up from the blessings of those they sat in the presence of. We sit in the presence, pick up from the blessings of those who they sat in the presence of. And hence our connection back to the Prophet will become shorter. Is that correct? It will become shorter. So the great Imam Abu Zakariya Yahya bin Shafiqin and Nawawi Sumat Dimashri radiallahu anhu. He says in his book, Riyadh al-Salihin al-Kalami Sayyid al-Mursaleen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sayyid al-Arifin in the chapter of Sabr. وعن أبي عبد الله خباب بن الأرض رضي الله عنه قال شكونا إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو متوسل بردة في ظل الكعبة فقلنا ألا تستنصر لنا ألا تدعو لنا؟ فقال: قد كان من قد كان من قبلكم يؤخذ الرجل فيحفر له في الأرض فيجعل فيها ثم يبدا بالمنشار فيوضع على رأسه فيجعل نصفين وينشر بأنشاط الحديد ما دون لحمه وعظمه ما يصده ذلك عن دينه والله لا الله هذا الأمر حتى يسير الراحل صنعاء إلى حضر موتا لا يخاف إلا الله والذب على غنمه ولكنكم تستعجلون رواه البخاري وفي رواية وهو متوسد بردة وقد لقينا من المشركين شدة سيدنا خباب بن الأرد سيدنا خباب بن الأرد was from amongst the poor Sahaba in Makkah al Mukarramah, from the early people who accepted Islam with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what type of people were they who accepted Islam with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Poor, uh, neglected people in society. Those who everyone neglected, they were the ones who came and accepted Islam. They were the ones who embraced Islam. Poor, the slaves, the foreigners. All of them they came and accepted Islam. Why? Because they saw that Islam was giving them their rights as human beings. The slaves in Mecca, they weren't being treated like human beings. What happened? So where did hope come to them from? Through Islam. That's why they accepted. Khabab ibn al-Araj was from amongst those poor Sahaba in Mecca to Mukarrama, who was uh, tortured and uh, persecuted by the people of Makkah. He said, Zayyidina Khabbab himself, he said, 
Shakona ila Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We complain to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa huwa mutawassifin burdatan fi zhil al-Ka'ba. Whilst he was resting and lying in the shade of the Ka'ba. He was resting in the shade of the Ka'ba and we complained to him. What did they complain about? Fa'ulna, Sayyidina Khabab said, we said, Ala tasnamsu lana. Will you not seek victory for us? Ala tadru lana. Will you not pray for us? Fa'qal. And in one narration, they said, he said, وَقَدْ لَقِيْنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ شِدَّةً Will you not pray for us? Will you not seek victory for us? Whilst we have gone through so much from these disbelievers in Mecca, so much hardship and tribulation. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, he said, there were people who went before you. يُخَذُ الرَّجُلُ One of them will be taken. فَيُحْفَرُ لَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ And a ditch will be dug for him in the earth. فَيُجَعْلُ فِيهَا And he will be placed in this ditch. ثُمَّ يُتَابِ مِنْ شَعْرِ Then a machete or an axe or a sword would be brought. فَيُضَعْ عَلَى رَتْسِهِ فَيُجَعْلُ بِسْمِهِ And it would be stuck on his head and his head would split into two. His head would split into two. وَيُرُمْ شَرْطِ بِهَمْ شَرْطِ الْحَدِيدِ And then his body would be combed with the combs of iron. His body would be combed with the combs of iron. مَا دُونَ رَحْمِهِ وَعَظْمِهِ And there would be nothing between between that comb and his flesh and his bones. مَا يَسُبُّهُ ذَلِكَ عَدْدِينِهِ None of that would prevent him and bar him and block him from his religion. Nothing. A ditch would be dug, it would be thrown in, his head would be split with a machete, his body would be combed with the comb of iron. مَا يَسُبْتُهُ ذَلِكَ عَنْ دِينِ That would not prevent him from his religion. Wallahi, the Prophet said, by Allah, لَيْتِمَّنَّ اللَّهُ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ Allah will complete this matter, i.e. his religion. Allah, the Prophet said, I swear by Allah that Allah will complete this religion. So much so. Remember, this was in Makkah to Mukarramah. People were, the Muslims were terrified. They were living in fear. They were under persecution. They were being tortured. And in such a situation, the Prophet ﷺ gives glad tidings to his Sahaba who had, it, it seemed like they were losing hope. And he gave them glad tidings that he said, by Allah, Allah will complete this religion. So much so, حَتَّى يَسِيرَ الْرَاكِمُ مِنْ صَنْعَاءِ لَا حَضْرَمُوا لَا يَخَافُ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَالثِّبَعَ لَا عَنَبِهِ So much so that Allah will complete and spread Islam that uh, a rider, a traveler would travel from Sat'a, the capital of Yemen, to Hadramaut, La ilaha He will not fear anyone except Allah and the wolf upon his sheep. i.e. Islam will spread to the depths of the Arabian Peninsula such that he would begin to travel between the cities between the provinces, between the districts, and you will not fear anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wolf. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ And the Prophet said to him, but you are hastening, you are hurrying, i.e. when they ask us to make victory for us, will you not pray for us? The Prophet is saying, be patient. Don't haste, don't be hasty, don't rush. Uh, be patient with what Allah is uh, trying you in, testing you in. And the future is bright, so much so that you will have safety and security across the Arabian Peninsula. 
Now, a statement like this, uh, speaking about the future, would raise the morals of the Sahaba, would raise uh, uh, and uh, would give them encouragement that the future will be with them and not against them. Because in Makkah and Mukarrama they were being tested so much, persecuted so much, that the Sahaba were coming to the Prophet and complaining, saying, Ya Rasulullah, will you not pray for us? After seeing what's happening, and the Prophet would give them stories of the earlier people who went through even worse, even more, just to save their religion. Just to save their religion. And the scholars have said in this hadith, what do we see? That patience is praiseworthy. Patience is praiseworthy upon punishment due to religion. So if someone is being persecuted due to his religion, if someone is being uh, harmed due to his religion, and he's patient upon that persecution, patient upon that harm, then this is a praiseworthy patience. Why? Because this person is being patient on the most precious thing that he has, which is his religion. <laughs> and in this hadith we also see that the Prophet was foreseeing and giving information of the future. And what was this information of the future that he was given? He said that people will ride from Sana'a to Hadramaut and they will be in absolute security. Absolute safety. They will not fear anyone. They won't be in any harm and any hardship. And did this happen? Of course. This occurred when Islam spread across the Arabian Peninsula. And this is from the signs of his prophecy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the Dala'i al-Nubuwa that he gave, he foresaw matters and they came true as he saw them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as he informed concerning them, Sadhu Ashab Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al Al Azab, and we see the patience of the Sahab, how patient they were upon all of the torture. Why? Because of their religion. Because they said Allah is one, and they accepted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they had to pay the price for that, and they were patient. Whereas their complaining to the Prophet wasn't due to frustration. You know, when they complained and said, will you not pray for us? Will you not seek victory for us? It wasn't because they were frustrated that they were giving up. But rather, they were asking the Prophet to pray for them and seek victory for them so that they could worship Allah in ease with peace uh, and that they could free themselves of torture and of persecution for worship and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in devotion. In this hadith we also learn of how to uh, follow the footsteps of the righteous and those righteous who were tested and they were tried they were patient. Al Adaru did the Iman Kadim. We also see in this hadith that enmity against religion and enmity against faith it's not a new phenomenon which has occurred in our times. So people speak about Islamophobia. People speak about Islamophobia. It's not it's nothing new to our religion. It's nothing new to our faith. It's been so long as our religion has been. Is that clear? وَيَجِبُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ أَنْ يَتَحَمَّلُ الْأَذَى وَاسْبِرُ عَلَى الْإِنْتِهَابِ And it's a must about the believing people that in every time, in every generation, in every era, in every century, when they are tried and tested because due to their religion, that they are patient. They are patient and that they bear uh, the hardships and difficulties. And Islam is the religion of security. 
and it's the religion of safety, and it's the religion of peace. It's the religion of peace. How do we see this? Because the Prophet said, I swear by Allah, Allah will complete this affair such that people who travel from Sana'a to Hadramaw, that they won't fear anyone. I.e. they will travel in a state of peace. They will travel in a state of tranquility. They will travel in a state uh, of peace and not in a state of war. Is that clear? وَعَنِ بْنِ مَسْرُودِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قال لما كان يوم يوم حنين آثر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ناسا في القسمة فأعطى الأقرع بن حابس مئة من الإبل وأعطى عيينة بن حسن مثل ذلك وأعطى ناسا من أشراف العرب وآثرهم يومئذ في القسمة سيدنا عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه سب on the day of حنين in the battle of Hunayn, after the battle had been completed, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he began to distribute the booty amongst the Sahaba, uh, he gave preference to certain people over others. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave preference to certain people over others. So for example, Al-Aqra ibn Habis, a particular individual, the Prophet gave him mi'atan min al-ibil. How much is mi'a? Hundred. He gave him a hundred camels. He gave him a hundred camels. وَأَعْطَى عُيَيْنَ دَنَّ حِسْنٍ مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ And he gave Uyayna, the son of Hisn, likewise. I.e. another hundred camels. And camels were the most expensive and the most precious of the Arabian wealth. وَأَعْطَى نَاسًا مِنْ أَشْرَافِ الْعَرَبِ And he gave, and he gave preference to certain individuals from amongst the elite of the Arabs. وَأَثَرَهُمْ يَوْمَيْتِنْ فِي الْقِسْمَةِ And he gave them preference that day in distribution. فَقَالَ رَدُلُ And a man said, he saw, this one particular individual, he saw the Prophet giving him a hundred, he's giving him a hundred, he's giving some more than others. Of the Arabs, he's giving them more. So, this one particular man said, Wallahi, inna hadi qisma al ma'udi la fiha. A man spoke out and he said, He said, By Allah, this distribution, ma'udi la fiha, has not been distributed justly. It has not been distributed justly. Wa ma'udi la fiha wajhullah. And Allah was not sought, i.e. Allah's pleasure was not sought in such a distribution. Who is he speaking about? He's extending his tongue concerning the Prophet ﷺ's distribution. The Prophet is distributing. He gives this man a hundred and gives that one a hundred and he gives certain individuals more than others. And this person, wretched person speaks out and says, this is not uh, uh, this is not a distribution in which uh, justice has been done. فقلت سيدنا عبد الله بن سعود هذا ما كان يقول. سيدنا عبد الله بن سعود said والله لا أخبرنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said I swear by God I'm going to go tell the prophet what you said. I'm going to go tell the prophet what you said. فأديه فأخبره بما قال. So سيدنا عبد الله said I came. And I informed the Prophet of what he said. When he heard وسلم, his blessed face changed and it became red. And then the Prophet said, And who's going to be just if Allah and His Messenger are not just? And then the Prophet said, يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ مُوسَى Allah have mercy upon Musa. قَدْ أُوذِيَ بِأَكْثَرَ مِنْ هَذَا فَصَبَرُ He was harmed. More than this, and he was patient. 
He was humble. More than this, and he was patient. And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, فَقُلْتْ I said, لَا جَرْمَ لَا أَرْفَعُ إِلَيْهِ بَعْدَهَا حَدِيثًا He said, after this day, I'm not going to inform him about anyone saying anything. Why? Because this upset the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This upset the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And how did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comfort himself? How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi comfort himself? By remembering Musa alayhi wa sallam. Is that clear? And one of the ways to comfort ourselves in times of difficulties is to remember those who are of higher rank than us and went through much worse and much more difficulties than us. That will become comfort for our hearts. That who are we to go through simple tribulation when people who were greater than us went through greater hardships. So the Prophet ﷺ comforted himself by remembering Musa He said, he said about the man, he said, so who's going to be just if Allah and his messenger are not just? And then the Prophet ﷺ comforted Musa and said, Allah have mercy upon Musa. He was, he was harmed more than this and he was patient. And so Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Sayyid felt bad in that he shouldn't have told the Prophet this. Why? Because they upset him, so Allah said, that after this I'm day I'm not going to mention anything. I'm not going to mention anything. Hunayn, the battle of Hunayn took place in an area known as Hunayn. And where does Hunayn come? At Ta'if, uh, behind Arafat, between it and Makkah to Bukarama, uh, there are uh, over nearly 20 miles between them. So who were these people that on the day of Hunayn the Prophet was giving them war and was giving them preference? They were of a particular type. They were known as Al-Mu'allafati Ulubuhu. Those whose hearts were being comforted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran the categories of people who are uh, eligible to take zakat. Categories of people who are eligible to take zakat. Allah said, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلِيمًا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُ Zakat is surely for the poor, for the needy, uh, for those who work upon it, and for those whose hearts are being comforted, i.e. for those who had newly came to Islam, and their hearts were not firm in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ would give them war. So by virtue of this material that comes into their hearts, they feel comfort in their hearts. Right? Why? Because anyone who gives you a present, uh, your attachment, your affiliation, uh, your friendship, your bond with them becomes stronger, it becomes firmer. Is that clear? It becomes stronger and it becomes firmer. So the Prophet said, Allah said, when he would see people still on the edge, they've accepted Islam, but they're still on the edge, he would give them from, from the world of Islam. Number one. The other types of people he would give, Tulaqa, uh, slaves who had been freed. Right? So a slave who's living with his master, he, he, he eats, he lives, he has a place to stay, and so on and so forth. But once he's freed, then uh, before he can make something of his own life, he's going to need some help. So the Prophet would give them also to help them build their lives. And he would also give Ru'asa al He would give the leaders of the Arabs who accept Islam, he would give them wealth. Why? Because those leaders would go back into their people and say, people become Muslim. For the Prophet gives a giving of a man who does not fear poverty. That's how she gave Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And the Sahaba Allah, and some of them, they said, we accepted Islam for the wealth that we saw that was coming to the Muslims. They were winning battle after battle, victorious in battle after battle. Only the booty was coming to who? To the Muslims. The Prophet would distribute. The Sahaba were getting rich. People were watching, you know, these guys are getting rich. So they were saying, you know what, we might as well become Muslim. They become Muslim and the Prophet would give them. Why? Because they were still on the edge. When the Prophet would give them, they would become firm. 
So some of the Sahaba said, we only became Muslim because of the wealth that we saw. But once we accepted Islam and the Prophet began to give us, then our intentions became correct. We rectified our intentions and Islam rectified our intentions and our hearts became firm with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Sa'ud mentions two people, Al-Atra ibn Habis, who the Prophet gave a hundred camels to, and Uyayna ibn Hassan, who the Prophet also gave a hundred camels to. As for Uyayna ibn Hassan, he was from those people who accepted Islam before the conquest of Mecca, and he attended uh, Hunayn. He attended Hunayn and al Ta'if. But after the Prophet وسلم, passed away from this world, he left Islam. Ayyid ibn Hassan, he left Islam. Summa raja'a ila Islam. Then he returned and became Muslim again. Is he still a companion? What do you think? Is he still a companion? So, uh, he accepted Islam with the Prophet وسلم. The Prophet وسلم, passed away from this world. Then Uriyad ibn Hassan left Islam. Then a short while later he became Muslim again. So Uriyad ibn Hassan, is he a companion? Is he? How is he a companion? How is he a companion? He left Islam. His companionship, all of his deeds were nullified. All of his actions were nullified. فَقَدْ حَبَطَ عَمَلُ Someone who leaves Islam, all of his actions, all of his deeds drop. So, for example, uh, after he left it, imagine he had performed Hajj. Imagine he had performed Hajj. And then he left Islam, then he returned to Islam. Does he have to make up Hajj again? Yes. Why? Because that first Hajj is nullified. Likewise, uh, he left Islam, which meant he lost his wife also. He lost his wife also. Now, when he returns to Islam, he needs to make nikah with her again. Is that clear? Yeah. So likewise, he uses the status of being a companion why? Because he left Islam. And the condition of being a companion is that someone accepts Islam, sees the Prophet وسلم, and then dies upon that state. He didn't die upon that state. He left Islam, then he returned again, but in his second, when he returned again, he didn't see the Prophet so he's someone who saw the Prophet and he's not a companion. Is that clear? There was a time when he was a companion, but then he didn't die as a companion. Is that clear? Sorry? Is it known why he left? It's not mentioned here, but uh, lots of people left after the Prophet passed away. Some left because they didn't want to pay zakat, as it's famous. Others left because they gave up. They said, if the prophets died, then there's no Islam. This is why Sayyidina Umar, what did he say? Uh, he said, was it Sayyidina Abu Bakr, one of the two, he said that uh, said that the Prophet has passed away from this world. And he said, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who doesn't die who exists all the time, right? So this, he mentioned this why? So that people don't give up Islam after the Prophet ﷺ passes away. Some, some of the Sahaba there, <coughs> attachment to the religion was totally through the Prophet ﷺ. Hence, uh, that they felt that if the Prophet ﷺ passes away, that's it, we don't need to continue with Islam. Is that fair? But this is not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Wa ma Muhammadu illa Rasul. Muhammad is but a messenger, i.e., he is a messenger from head to toe. He is entire.
entire life as a messenger. قد خلت من قبله الرسل. Plenty of messengers have come before him. أفعل ماذا أو قتل قلبتم على أعقابكم if he dies or if he is martyred in قلبتم على أعقابكم will you turn back on yourselves? That's the question. Some people turn back on themselves when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم passed away. So that was one. Then the other person that the Prophet mentioned was Al Aqra ibn Muhabis. And he was from the masters of the tribe of Tamim. The masters of the tribe of Tamim. And he was an honorable person in the days of Jahiliyyah and in the days of Islam. And the Prophet would highly honor those who were honorable in Jahiliyyah. He would also honor them in Islam. So for example, when leaders of tribes would become Muslim, the Prophet would, uh, would keep that leadership for them after the Islam also. He wouldn't say, okay, I'm going to make someone else a leader. No, those leaders, the Prophet would keep them in their positions. Why? Because this would be good for them. This would be good for them in knowing that Islam hasn't taken away from their prestige and honor that they had before Islam. Okay. And the Prophet used to honor the honorable, as it's mentioned in the Shama'id. Kana yukrimu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana yukrimu, karima kulli qawm. He would honor the honorable of every nation, of every people, of every tribe. Is that clear? Why? Because if you, if you honor the honorable of a people, then it's as if you have honored all of the people. Because the people, they look up to the most honorable amongst them. Uh, and they, anyone who they see to honor that person finds a, a place in the hearts of all of the people. Is that clear? This is why the Prophet was always eager to present Islam to the leaders of people, to the leaders of tribes. Because if they become Muslim, everyone will become Muslim behind them. So the man who actually said and made this righteous comment, he was known as Zul Khuwaisiyah. Zul Khuwaisiyah. And in another narration, the Prophet وسلم, said about him, Zul Khuwaisiyah, after he made this comment, the Prophet وسلم, said, when he dies, he will be killed by the best of the people upon the earth, and the army that he will die in will be the worst of people upon the earth. And the Prophet also said, uh, when he dies, his hand, his hand, the, 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 the flesh of his hand will, 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 will pop out. The flesh of his hand will come out like the chest of him. The flesh of his hand will come out like the chest of a woman. And those Sahaba who witnessed, who witnessed that battle, and they saw that Zul Khuwaisiyah died exactly the way the Prophet had mentioned. Why? Because he made this righteous comment uh, and he said uh, that the Prophet had not made a just a distribution of this world. We learn from this hadith that nasiha, counsel and good advice, as the Prophet mentioned in the other hadith, is for Allah, His Messenger, and the believing people. Allah and the Messenger and the believing people. So we take nasiha, we take a lesson from this hadith that anything that the Prophet does is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to do. For he does not act from his own desires and his own whims. 
الصفق عن عزارات اللئام سنة قديمة في الأنبياء and forgiving and overlooking the shortcomings of lowly people is an old sunnah of the prophets is an old sunnah of the prophets the prophet didn't say to the sahaba go and chase him and kill him and do x y and z with him no he left him we see the wisdom of the prophet in bringing the hearts of those uh, who are still on the edge and whose hearts were not yet firm with islam bringing them close by giving them And we see that the Prophet ﷺ was taking uh, comfort from Musa السلام, and Allah said, Fabi Allah said, and by their guidance they take path.